morning. Hope you are all well and ready for God's word for you today. Um, as we were worshiping, um, the Lord laid it on my heart to um, bring out this flag and wave it over the church, over the members of the church. Um, because white, what do you think it represents? Surrender? Holiness, purity, orientation. Can represent some of those things. Um, our go to it is normally, we think, surrender, right? The, the white flag, wave the white flag, surrender. Um, but one of the things that it symbolizes in Scripture is also victory. Um, and so the Lord was speaking uh, that he wants you to walk in and live in his victory. Um, but the fact that it means surrender, um, kind of in a general sense, um, culturally, I think is quite significant as well. Because... The way that we have victory in Christ, victory through the Lord, is to surrender ourselves, to surrender our sense of control and self-determination, um, to allow Him to be the one who leads us and guides us and has His way with what He desires for us, which is to live a victorious life. Amen? Amen. So, um, we're getting into the Word today, and I'm going <clears> to... <throat> Start straight off with um, God's word in Ephesians, excuse me, in Exodus. I'm so used to saying Ephesians because we've been doing a series in Ephesians and like naturally rolls, rolls off the tongue. Um, so uh, then we're starting with um, some scriptures from Exodus and we'll kind of go throughout various points in scripture to um, talk about something that the Lord really confirmed many, many, many times over throughout the week was something that he wanted me to talk about. And um, so beginning in verse 1 of Exodus 1, um, we read, Now a new king arose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply, and in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us, and depart from the land. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. And they built for Pharaoh storage cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread out, so that they were in dread of the sons of Israel. The Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor in mortar and bricks, and at all kinds of labor in the fields all their labors which they rigorously imposed on them. So the Israelites had entered the land of Egypt when Joseph was a governor under a pharaoh who was willing to allow all of Joseph's, Joseph's extended family, who were not a massive number of people, I mean, maybe a hundred, hundred-ish people, and even that is unlikely. Um, but let's just go with about a hundred people, right? Um, so this large extended family um, enters Egypt, and they live there to escape the drought um, and the famine caused by the drought that had hit the land of Canaan, where they had been living, um, and all the neighboring nations. And there was food, there was grain in Egypt, and through God's wisdom, uh, through Joseph, the grain supply in Egypt lasted throughout the drought that eventually hit Egypt as well, um, and lasted seven years in Egypt. Um, and while the Hebrew people, the Israelites, were living in Egypt, they multiplied. And they multiplied a lot. And eventually they became much more than an extended family. They became the 12 tribes. And they became more like hundreds of thousands of people. Um, so God prospered them in the land of Egypt. And what God had intended to be a blessing upon them, his grace, his unearned undeserved favor upon the Israelites by bringing them out of a place of death and famine and into a place of plenty, this new Pharaoh who came in, who didn't know Joseph, was fearful. He was fearful of the people of God. He was fearful of what God might do through them because he was witnessing through his own eyes that God was prospering them. And now this Pharaoh didn't worship God. He worshipped all the pagan idols of Egypt. And so he had no understanding that God's hand was on the people of Israel. And so, out of his fear, 
out of his dread, this Pharaoh decided that he was going to make life really hard for the Israelites, that he was going to oppress them, that he was going to essentially enslave them and make their lives bitter. Sometimes we experience things where God pours out his grace and his favor. We were singing about God's grace uh, and God's blessing upon us earlier. And I was just thinking about how many times have you received the favor of God, received a blessing of God, and eventually, through hardships and difficulties and trials, that blessing that God has given you becomes a point of stress in your life, a point of hardship and difficulty. Um, I was thinking about the house that Ruth and I um, are renting. Um, it was so God's hand that we are in that house. Uh, it was through um, a woman from the church who, whose sister knew the landlords because they walked their dogs together. And, uh, and through this interesting link that just really shouldn't have happened, um, we found out that there was a house that they had bought that they were refurbishing and the timing was perfect, which is not a normal time of year to move in January, uh, end of January, um, that somehow we were gonna be able to move into this house just when they were finishing it up. And, um, and so clearly God's hand through this whole process. Um, well, right now our house has a serious damp problem and leading to a mold problem. Um, and so it's quite stressful at times. Um, and so it can get a bit frustrating. I was sharing with the men at breakfast yesterday that um, our kitchen um, on the day before the breakfast was completely covered in, in dust um, from them repointing the house and grinding out the mortar in the back and it coming through the windows. And so prep that I had planned to do the night before, the day before I couldn't do um, because they would have been chewing on grit. Um, so, um, so I had this whole kitchen to clean up, this massive dust cloud, um, and, and I was really quite frustrated. Um, and this process of getting the house in a state where um, it really is meant to be can be quite trying at times. Um, our landlords are wonderful people. Um, and they're working very hard, and so I can't fault them at all for any efforts that they're making. I mean, they're going above and beyond. It's just a, not a great situation right now. But I know that that house is a blessing for Ruth and I. I know that is God's favor upon us to be there. Um, and the enemy tries to convince us sometimes that what God provides for us, what God's favor has brought to us as a blessing, is somehow a curse. And he often does that through circumstances that could lead to us becoming bitter or embittered towards what it is that is truly a blessing from the Lord. This Pharaoh tried to do that to the Israelites, tried to make God's hand of blessing and favor upon them and God's provision for them to grow and become the great nation that he had always said that they were going to be from generation to generation. He was trying to turn that blessing, his favor upon them. Pharaoh was trying to turn that into bitterness by imposing hard labor and difficult circumstances upon God's people. Now, if any of you were at the Christian Passover that we did earlier this year, you might remember that we ate bitter herbs and that eating the bitter herbs is part of the Passover celebration. And the bitter herbs are eaten to remember, excuse me, I say that with an American, herbs. The bitter herbs. The bitter herbs, you know, we say herbs where I'm from. The bitter herbs um, <laughs> are, um, they're eaten to remember the bitterness that the people experience under the oppression of that Pharaoh. And you also might remember, or you might not, that the, those bitter herbs are dipped in salt water. And the salt water symbolically means tears, right? So those tears on the bitter herbs aren't just about the hardship and the difficulty and the tears that the Israelites were crying because of their oppression. But those tears are also to remember the horrible things that happened to the Egyptians themselves as the oppressors of God's people, that God poured out punishment 
on those who were trying to oppress his people. And many, 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 many Egyptians died through the plagues that hit the land of Egypt while the Hebrew people survived. And so every single year, when the Jewish people celebrate the Passover, or if Christians, if we um, celebrate a redeemed or, or Christian Passover, we recount, we remember, not just the bitterness, but that God didn't want the Israelites to remain in that place of bitterness towards the Egyptians. That he wants there to be mercy from those who were oppressed back to their oppressors to remember that those oppressors also suffered because of the situation and because of what was going on. It's something that we can look back at today and say, over that situation, there is no remaining bitterness between the Jewish people and the Egyptians. There are other things that have happened since where there might be some issues, but over that situation, there is no historic bitterness because God, every single year, has the people deal with the fact that, yes, the Egyptians oppressed you. Yes, they made your life very, very difficult, but they suffered because of it. And God didn't want that suffering. It's a sad, tearful, sorrowful thing that they had to go through what they went through. So jumping ahead in Exodus, we read this about the Passover. And it says, Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night, the flesh of the lamb, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs, along with its entrails. Yummy. Um, and you shall not leave any of it over until morning. But whatever is left of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat it in this manner, with your loins girded, with your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all of the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And of course, the blood on the doorpost and on the lintel represents the blood of Christ that was shed for us. Scripture tells us that Christ is our Passover. So God's people, the Israelites, weren't done yet having to learn how to let him handle hardships where bitterness can try to take root. Because shortly after they escaped from Egypt, they faced a new problem with bitterness. And we read this also in Exodus in chapter 15. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and when they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water, when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore it was named Marah, and Marah means bitterness. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Then he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. Therefore he made them a statute and regulation, and there he tested them. And he said, if you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer. So, why a tree? Why throwing a tree into bitter waters? How, how does that make bitter waters sweet? You know, a lot of people have tried to say, well, it must have been this type of tree that has that type of effect on the water. Um, but most theologians agree, um, as do I, that the tree represents the cross of Jesus Christ. That through the cross, the bitterness of life 
can be made sweet. The death penalty that we deserve because of our sins and because of our issues, because of our hard hearts, are dealt with through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his blood shed for us, his life given for us on his cross. I believe that it was a prophetic foreshadowing of his cross. And that turning those bitter waters at Mara from being something that was toxic and full of death to something that is full of the goodness of God and life-giving is something that Jesus promises to all who will come to him and drink. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who, who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So the rivers of water that flow from the innermost part of those who drink of the goodness of Jesus Christ is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, living inside of those who are born again by water and by the Spirit, as Jesus explains. Truly, truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. You see, it's great to confess belief in the gospel. Belief that Jesus Christ is the only name under heaven by which you may be saved. And even to get baptized in water. But unless someone is born, born both of water, as in drinking from the water that only Jesus can give, and then also having the living waters that come through like a river flowing in your innermost being, by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that person cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It's a really important thing for us to understand. Now, after Jesus had been glorified and ascended into heaven, Jesus' disciples began to share the gospel. And we read this account of what happened in a certain city in Samaria that will give us some insight into how this plays out for somebody who was a believer but didn't receive the Spirit. Acts 8, 9 through 24 says, Now there was a man named Simon, who formerly was practicing magic in the city, and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from the smallest to the greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. So they were attributing to him something along the lines of being the Holy Spirit. Um, so that's a pretty big deal, right? And Simon wasn't sad about that, right? Because, you know, that gave him a lot of kudos uh, and a lot of authority and control over people. And they were giving him attention because he had, a long, had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. They were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. So this man, who was very much against Christ, and was somebody who had been bewildering and just amazing the people and all these people were looking to him as if he was some kind of special power and authority from God that he was the power of God incarnate right when he heard the gospel he was like no this is truth this is right I, I, I want to get baptized as well right and then we read on now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God they sent them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they had their water baptism in Jesus' name, but they hadn't been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Then they began laying their hands on them. 
and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Could you imagine <laughs> doing such a thing? I mean, it sounds so bizarre to us. And yet, there it is. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you. Okay, so not just the silver perish, but you perish too. Okay, that's, that's, wow. May your silver perish with you. Because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Simon was a believer. He was a believer in Christ. He'd been baptized. He, he was professing Christ as Savior, as Messiah, as the promised one of God. He believed the gospel. He was part of the church in Samaria. He had been born of water but had not yet been born of the Spirit. And when he saw Peter and John had been baptizing the new converts in Samaria in the Holy Spirit, Simon wanted to buy what God, through Peter and John, was about to give him for free. But Simon was so accustomed to being in control that he wanted to control the way that God was going to work in his life. And he wanted real power because people used to think that he had power through magic arts. But now that they had witnessed the true power of God through the miracles that Philip and later Peter and John were doing by the Holy Spirit working through them, the people of Samaria were no longer impressed by Simon's tricks. When Peter called Simon out for being in the gall of bitterness. What Peter was saying was that Simon had such a deep root of bitterness in him that he was spewing out stomach acid, that he was vomiting up bile. Yeah, that's how bad and how deep the bitterness in Simon had become. Now, we don't know what caused Simon to become that bitter, but whatever it was, certainly happened before he became a believer in Jesus Christ, and probably before he began to practice the magic arts. And it is quite possible that it's what led him to do that. We were talking about similar stuff, not, not quite the same, um, yesterday at breakfast, uh, about people wanting to put forth a false image. Uh, and sometimes, you know, uh, I was talking about, you know, years ago, I was, you know, was quite buff and huge and, you know, worked out for hours a day, and, and, uh, and so I was putting forth this whole tough guy image. Not intentionally, but, you know, but that was part of what goes along with it. Um, and I didn't even realize that that's what I was doing fully. Um, because of some wound, some hardship, some difficulty in his life, something caused Simon to want to be looked up to by the people around him. And so he turned to magic tricks. He turned to something that was not of God. And he'd gotten so accustomed to having authority and control over people, beguiling them, that he had not fully surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. He was still in chains to his sin. The fact that Simon was a believer in Christ, who had been water baptized, hadn't changed that. Because Simon was not truly willing to change. Remember in Exodus 15, 26, that God said, For I, the Lord, am your healer. Well, Simon, still wanting to be in control, meant that he wanted to be Lord of his own life. 
But unless God is our Lord, is the authority over us, he isn't going to heal our bitterness. Because in order for God to be our Lord, we have to do what he tells us in his word. We have to trust that his ways are better than our ways. We have to do what his word says we're called to do, knowing that it's a blessing upon us, knowing that it's good for us. So you may remember this from our series in Ephesians, and now I can say Ephesians and we say the right scripture. Uh, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. And the way to counteract this, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So, when Simon confessed that he believed in Jesus Christ and that he wanted to baptize, be baptized, his sins were forgiven. But he held on to some. He didn't fully surrender them. Because that bitter root had such control in his <clears throat> life. And he felt like he had control in his life. But really it was the bitterness that controlled him. That had infested him. It infested him. Had uh, overtaken him. To the point where it was coming out of him. It was vomiting forth from him. The antidote, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Now, there are plenty of things listed here in addition to bitterness that we need to deal with. So why am I focused on bitterness? Well, let's look at Hebrews 12, 15. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. What is the grace? I talked about it earlier. It's unearned, unmerited favor. It's something that we don't deserve, right? And so sometimes we feel like we have to earn it. Simon felt like he had to buy it. Because when we do it in our strength, that means that somehow we're still in control. Sometime, somehow we have the power and the authority over what God is going to do in our lives. But that's not what grace is. It's unearned. It's undeserved. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. In her book, Having a Merry Spirit, Joanna Weaver wrote in 2006, Bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Steve Farrar also wrote the same quote in Finishing Strong, going the distance for your family in, 20, in, in the year 2000. And some people attribute that quote to Buddha, but that has been debunked. Others attribute it to Mel Nelson Mandela, but the original quote was most likely about resentment, and it came from St. Augustine of Hippo, who said, resentment is like taking poison and hoping the other person dies. What he basically meant is that bitterness is usually caused by our anger at someone else, but it takes a toll on us rather than the person we're angry at. But Hebrews 12.15 makes it clear that bitterness causes trouble and defiles many. So it doesn't just impact the person who is bitter. It impacts all of the people around them. The whole church will be poisoned. A person with unresolved bitterness will hurt other people, will cause trouble, and spread their bitterness like a flu, because it is the only water that is in them, like the bitter waters of Mara. And the saying is true, that hurt people hurt other people. Bitter people spread their bitterness. Wounded people, their wounds, if they aren't healed, those wounds get infected. And that infection spreads. As members of the body of Christ, we need to watch out that that root of bitterness does not get a chance to spring up in our own lives. And we have to also expect 
and look out for the possibility of it growing up in someone else's life. We simply can't take the stance that it's not my problem by allowing bitterness to take root. We allow the defilement of every Christian that bitterness comes into contact with. So, when you see this picture, what do you see? A church. A, church? a fairly pretty church, right? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> this is just down the street from our house. Our house is at the end of the road down there. Um, so think about it this way. Bitterness, in Hebrews 12, 15, is called a root of bitterness. And that possibly comes from the fact that wormwood was often used as the word for bitterness. And like all plants, wormwood has roots. And those roots want to grow and spread so that the plant, even if it's a weed and quite a poisonous plant, um, can thrive and spread and grow and spread ultimately its poison. That bitter root needs to be uprooted and all of the little tiny filial roots need to be completely dealt with or the bitter wormwood is going to grow up again. When you see the photo of this church building, you see that quite nice looking place where Christians could gather together to worship the Lord and grow and have fellowship together. But if you look closely at the next slide, you see something growing at the base of the steeple here. And it's part of my normal route when I'm walking our dog Huxley. Um, I look up and I always see this. And um, over the years, I've been seeing it grow and grow and grow, and it hasn't been dealt with. Um, and I look up there and I think, um, at first I thought it was a Fudlia, but I took this photo yesterday. Um, and I thought, you know, Fudlia, it, it's got some pretty serious roots that can cause a problem, but you can't tell from where you're at probably, but that's actually a tree. Um, yeah, even worse. Um, and so what looked like a little weed uh, a couple years ago is steadily becoming a tree that is spreading its roots wherever it can grow. And as it does that, it is compromising the entire integrity of the steeple. And eventually, if that root of that plant, if that thing is not completely removed, that steeple will fall. And if there are people around there, which often there are on walks, uh, not at the church anymore because that church is shut, um, that steeple will topple and fall and could really hurt or even kill people who are nearby. So here's another example for you. Anyone have one of these? Yeah, some of you might have some because I think we, we rooted some <laughs> and, and, and gave them out to people at church. Uh, so we've got a couple of them. This isn't ours. Um, I almost brought one of ours in. Um, so, yeah, it was too heavy. Um, so the spider plant, it sends out these little mini plants, right? And if one of these little shoots um, can find water or soil, those little shoots will become plants in their own right. And um, essentially, the spider plant is colonizing whatever soil or water it can find in order to spread. They make great house plants because they're very hard to kill and they look cool. Um, <laughs> but if given the chance, they will happily take over. It's the same with bitterness. It is never satisfied having a little place in someone's life. It, it wants to and it will grow and it will spread and it will take over our lives if we let it fester and don't truly make Jesus Lord of our lives and not only believe but truly follow him and do the things that are evidence that he is our Lord and no one else's, not ourselves, not our families, not our friends, not our jobs, not our education, not some issue from our past, 
no matter if it was 30 minutes ago or 30 years ago. And that unresolved, unsurrendered, unhealed bitterness won't just become poison in our own lives. It will, become, it will come out of us. It will spew forth from us like stomach acid, like bile being vomited out on those around us. And they will get poisoned also. It's a disgusting image, right? And it's meant to be. Because it's a horrible reality. If you have bitterness in you, if it's from unforgiveness, then you better start forgiving. Forgiving is not an option for those to whom Jesus is Lord. Think of the Israelites who ate the bitter herbs and still to this day remember every single year at the Passover that the Egyptians who put that bitterness, that bitter situation on them faced the consequences for doing that. And when they dipped those bitter herbs, remembering the bitter circumstances of their lives in the salt water, they're demonstrating compassion for those Egyptians who died because they were used as pawns by a fearful, bitter, and jealous pharaoh. There is no historic animosity, as I said before, between the Jews and Egyptians over the events of the Exodus because God, as the Lord of the Israelites, was their healer and helped them overcome what could have been a root of bitterness that would have otherwise spread. If your bitterness is from jealousy, learn to be thankful for what you have and don't compare what other people have to what God has graced you with. Seek God's understanding through his word about coveting and comparing. It's been said that comparison kills, and I think a very strong biblical case could be made for that. Whatever the seed that bitterness has planted in your life, figure out what it is and what you need to do to uproot that poisonous weed and get every last tiny bit of that root out of your system, out of your soul, or risk not having those rivers of living water flowing in your innermost self and instead being filled with bitter waters, like the waters of Mara, where there is no true life. Jesus came to set the captives free. But if you like having the sense of control, that control is a bondage of sin, just like Simon had. Allow yourself to go and drink deeply of the well that is Jesus Christ. Allow yourself to make room in your spirit for his spirit to dwell in you and for those living waters to come forth from you. So that instead of bitter bile, you have life-giving water that flows through you and from you to a desperate world that so much needs to hear the gospel and see it lived out. Crown Jesus in your heart. Make room for more of him. Amen? Amen. Turn it over to Ruth. <coughs> She's going to do our offering and worship.